going to tell you about one of the most popular and exciting characters in all of the Bible, the man Moses. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. He traveled back in time to see the events of Genesis. He shows up in Matthew 17. We use his books for our learning today in the church age. Romans 15, 4 says, The things which were written before time are written for our learning. Moses will eventually end up in the tribulation as one of the two witnesses. So if you think about it, Moses has either seen or been a part of or is looked back on in pretty much every dispensation in the scriptures. I mean, he's in Genesis in the sense that he went back and saw the events of it to write it. He was there in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, saw it firsthand and wrote about it. And then all through the Old Testament, what do they look back on? The law of Moses. Then you get in the Gospels. There he is in the book of Matthew on the Mount of Transfiguration. Then you get into the church age and, you know, everybody knows about Moses. The law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And we look back on all of his stories for our admonition and then you get into the tribulation, there he is, shows up as one of the two witnesses. You get into the millennial kingdom, there he'll be. You know, it's a really exciting character in the Bible, really popular character. So let's look at Deuteronomy 34 and see what we can get for our learning from Moses. Deuteronomy 34 and verse 1, it says, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab into the mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah, that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead unto Dan, and all Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Manasseh, and all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea, and the south, and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, unto Zoar, and the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. So he did not get to go over into the promised land. You know what this shows us? What can we learn from this? is that Moses is a person just like me and you. Moses' anger had caused him to lose out on going into the promised land back there in Numbers 20, 11 through 12. So he's a person just like me and you. A person who paid the price for disobedience. You see, Moses smote the rock twice. He was just supposed to speak to the rock back there in Numbers 20, 11 through 12. And even though he had obeyed God in many other ways throughout his life, this decision caused him to lose out on the promised land. He could not go over thither, it said. And this reminds me how I will suffer loss at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.15 talks about how we will suffer loss for things. And I'm going to reap in the flesh for sins that I've done. Galatians 6, 8. You know, Paul talks about in Galatians 6. He says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. I'm going to reap some things because of disobedience. I'm going to pay the price for disobedience. Just as there is no respect of persons in salvation, Romans 2, 11, it is also true for rewards. If Moses suffered a loss, I'm definitely going to suffer a loss. You see, Moses may not have made it into the promised land like Joshua. Here's something else. He may not have made it into the promised land like Joshua, but the Lord is going to continue to use Moses in the future. You see him show up in Matthew 17, 3. You're going to see him show up in Revelation chapter 11. You see, you may have messed up in the past. You may have done something really dumb, and it's ruined your reputation even. 
So you may not make it into some certain Christian circle of Christians you would like to fellowship with because they, they know about your past and they've got a big X on you. You may not be considered a part of some particular club at your church or really get to sit on a certain pew that you would like to at church or maybe even get invited to some big meeting. If you're a preacher and you've done something in the past, you're not going to get invited to some big meeting with the big dogs. But God can still use you. Just like Moses, he didn't get to go to the promised land, but God still used him. He comes back in a big way. I mean, you're going to pay the price for disobedience, but God's not putting you on the shelf either. So Moses, he's a person just like me and you. A lot of people really looked up to Moses too much, but he's a person just like me and you. He paid the price for disobedience. Number two, he's a problem for the devil. You see, in Deuteronomy 34, 6, after Moses died, it says, And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. You see that? Who buried him? It says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him. Who did? The Lord did in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And this is him once again being a problem for the devil. But you see, from the days of Moses' duel there with Pharaoh and the magicians all the way to the tribulation, you know, from his birth to his death, and afterwards, Moses has been a problem. You know, they, they tried to put a hit on him when he was first born. He wouldn't die. Uh, they came back later on and tried to kill him when he was an adult, and he, they couldn't get him. And then he, had all the, he brought all those plagues on Egypt. You know, he's been a problem for the dark side. He's a problem for the devil. He, another thing, he pastored the largest church. Think about that. If you think about it, Moses had the first megachurch. However, it was a biblically sound megachurch. And Moses delivered probably two million people of Israel from the bondage of Pharaoh, the devil's man. He was a problem for the dark side. And he stayed close to God as he led them through the wilderness. You know how much that changed the course of history there. That was a problem. For the devil. You see, the thing you're doing for the Lord may seem like an improbable and impossible task, but remember that Moses didn't start his church until he was like 80. Uh, you never, you're never too old to start now. You can begin to be a problem for the devil today. Okay, if you're listening to this and you're 80 and you haven't done anything for the Lord, you can start now. You don't know when you're going to die. You could live till you're 95 years old. Imagine if you started just witnessing to people now. And say you uh, won one person to the Lord a month. You could live till you're 90. You don't know. And that would be over 100 people you led to the Lord by the time you die. It's not so much how you start. It's how you finish. Imagine, okay, you're 80 right now read the Bible through one time a year, you could live till you're 90, you could have the Bible read 10 times. That's more than most Christians. See, you're never too old. Go ahead and start being a problem for the dark side right now. So, you see, Moses was a problem. He pastored the largest church and he caused problems. He didn't give up. And another thing, he was privately buried by God himself. You see, Moses escaped the devil's hitmen when he was born back there in Exodus 2. And now after, the, after his death, the devil was still looking for his body. You know, just like in Jude 1 and verse 9, where it says, 
Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation. You see, the devil got into it with Michael about the body of Moses. He was wanting Moses' body after he died. But no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. So Moses shows back up on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, 3. And he's going to show up as a thorn in the flesh to the Antichrist in Revelation chapter 11. No wonder the devil wanted his body. You see, he finished his course, and he's coming back for another one. He's going to be a problem again for the dark side. This should remind you how the Lord can continue to use you even after your death. He still used Moses after his death, just as he still uses the voices of dead saints on cassette tapes, on study Bibles, in books and stories, and, and just even the morals that are passed down from that person. They're continued to be used after death. You can redeem the time, buy back time, Ephesians 5.16, by recording your voice, and the audio lives on after you die. I doubt one day passes by that someone isn't hearing a guy like Peter Ruckman preach or at least read from his huge library of books that he has. I doubt one day passes by that that, that doesn't go on. He's living on after he died. You can live on after you die and get rewards at the judgment seat of Christ after you die. And get, I mean, get, earn some rewards for the judgment seat of Christ even after you die. Moses, he's he's still living on from what all he allowed the Lord to do through him. I doubt I there's not one day that passes by that somebody did not read out of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the five books that Moses wrote. So he's been a problem. For the dark side. All right, the next thing, he's preserved by God. He was preserved by God. And Deuteronomy 34 7, look what it says. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. So Moses' body never lost its physical abilities. So he's preserved by God. God prolonged. His prime. Moses was 120 and was still a mountain climber. He went up to the top of Pisgah there in Deuteronomy 34 without a hover round, without a walker, without a wheelchair. He didn't need glasses to see the promised land he was missing out on. He didn't need a hearing aid to hear God's voice. He was probably in better shape than I am. And the more you live for God, the more likely you are to prolong your days. Just like it says in Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, you actually prolong your days by doing what you're supposed to do. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with, with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And Ecclesiastes 7.17 talks about, Be not over much wicked, why should thou die before thy time? You see, if you live like you're supposed to, you, you live longer. You know, Paul says in Romans, he says, For he that liveth for the flesh shall die. If you live for the flesh, you're going to shave time off of your life. But if you live godly, you're going to live longer. Now, you may... You may not live to be 100. You may die when you're 80, even though you lived godly. But imagine when you would have died if you had lived wickedly. You may have died at 40, you see. You know, since bodily exercise profiteth little, 1 Timothy 4, 8, the best thing to work on is staying spiritually fit, having your senses exercised, to discern both good and evil. evil. Hebrews 5.14. You know, stay sharp in the scriptures by reading and studying and praying and challenging yourself to get better. You can stay sharp. Have it, keep it 
your mind exercised and your mind is going to go a lot longer. God can preserve your mind, pro prolong the prime of your mind. <clears throat> you know, you might be like, you know, Lester Roloff, who died a bit early, even though he lived godly. But imagine when he would have died if he didn't live godly. He may have died 20 years earlier. Or you could be like Ruckman, who lived up to his mid-90s. You know, give your best shot to exercise thyself rather unto godliness, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and you'll be rewarded for it at the judgment. God preserved Moses. He prolonged his prime. Moses never lost his physical abilities. The next thing about Moses, he passed down his leadership in Deuteronomy 34. Look at Deuteronomy 34, 9. It says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses. So, you see, Joshua was pretty much Moses' right-hand man, the captain of his army. You know, back there, when they went against um, Amalek, it was Joshua choosing out... Moses had Joshua choose him out soldiers, and Joshua was going out there and fighting with Amalek. And, you know, Moses was up up there and he had his hands up. And as long as he kept his hands up, he, uh, Israel would win. When he put his hands down, Amalek would win. But Joshua was out there fighting that battle. Joshua would have been even back there before they even left Egypt. He would have been under the bondage of Pharaoh. He went through all that. He went through all the wilderness journey for 40 years. And he was one of the only ones, him and Caleb, that wanted to go in to possess the land, to get it from the giants back there. And see, he was with Moses all that time. And Moses passed down his leadership. He persistently used and trained Joshua. Imagine being Joshua and training under the man who wrote the five books of Scripture. And could explain the law perfectly. Because John 1.17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And Moses, being under the... Uh, Joshua was under Moses, the meekest man on the earth, as it calls him in Numbers 12.3. Moses had laid hands on him, and Joshua was full of the spirit of wisdom. And Joshua ends up taking... Israel farther than Moses and takes them into the promised land. And that's a great picture there because Joshua pictures the Lord Jesus. Moses pictures the law. The law couldn't get them into the promised land. But Joshua did. You see, the law couldn't save me. But Jesus got me in. And we need to... Do like Moses did Joshua. We need to train men to pick up the torch in such a way that they go beyond where we were in our Bible journey. Joshua trained under Moses and then went beyond where Moses did. He went into the promised land. You see, why gain a whole lot of Bible knowledge if you're not going to train men so that they can teach others also, as Paul says for Timothy to do in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2. So, Moses, he passed down his leadership, persistently used and trained Joshua. The next thing about Moses is that he is a prophet who saw the Lord. In Deuteronomy 34.10, it says, And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And the thing about Moses such a great prophet that he is a picture of the prophet of prophets. In Acts 3.22, look what it says. In Acts 3 and verse number 22, it says, And it shall come to... Or no, it says, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. That's the Lord Jesus is the prophet like unto Moses. So he is a picture of the prophet of prophets. 
And here are some ways that Moses pictures the Lord Jesus. Both had men try to kill them as a baby. That's Exodus one twenty two and Matthew two sixteen. Both were adopted. That's Exodus two ten, Matthew one twenty five. Both sent to deliver Israel. That's Exodus two eleven and Matthew fifteen twenty four. Both saved a woman at a well. That's Exodus two fifteen and John four twenty nine. Both are shepherds. Exodus three one and John ten eleven. Both came at a time when Israel was in bondage to somebody. For Moses, they were in bondage to Egypt. When the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, they were in bondage to Rome. Moses did signs and wonders. Exodus 4, Matthew 4.23. Both fasted 40 days. Exodus 34.28, Matthew 4.2. So you see, that's just a few ways that Moses pictures the prophet of prophets. Now, me and you, we should remind, just like Moses, you can look at his life and it reminds you of the life of Jesus Christ. We should remind people of Jesus Christ and become so conformed to him that we become a walking, talking picture of the Lord. You know, we can't earn our salvation, obviously. We have already got it. But we should live in a way that earns the title Christian. Just like they were called Christians and Acts 11.26, because they acted so much like the Lord Jesus. So Moses, he is a prophet who saw the Lord. He pictures the prophet of prophets. And the next thing, he had power to do signs and miracles. And Deuteronomy 34, look back there again. Deuteronomy 34, 11 through 12. It says, And all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, and in all that mighty hand and in all that great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. So Moses, he had power to do signs and miracles. Moses was the first faith healer, snake handler, you would say. He picked up the rod, it became a snake. He dropped the rod, it became a snake. He picked it up, it turned back into a rod again. He was the first faith healer. He was a, as a prophet to Israel, he came with signs because the Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians one twenty two. So he had power to do signs and miracles. He preached the word with signs following. In Exodus 4, in verse 1, Moses told the Lord, they will not believe me. So the Lord gave him signs to convince Israel. So Moses was going to Israel. God knew they required a sign, 1 Corinthians one twenty two. So Moses was given the power to do signs and wonders. And this wasn't to make Moses look more spiritual, but rather to convince Israel that Moses was, in fact, a deliverer from God. And today, the Lord doesn't give his preachers signs and wonders like Moses or like an apostle. You know, 2 Corinthians 12, 12 talks about the signs of an apostle. You see, we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. We are those who have seen, who are, we are those who have not seen and yet have believed, like Jesus told Thomas about in John twenty twenty nine. So even though we don't have signs and wonders like Moses to cause people to believe the words, the Lord gives you the power and the ability to be a light so that the world can see the Lord Jesus Christ in you. And he gives us a book to stand by and defend to show wondrous things out of. Psalm 119, verse 18. So Moses, he had those signs and miracles he could perform and get skeptics to believe him by those signs and miracles. Me and you don't have that. We've got to use the scriptures. We've got to be a light. We've got to let we got to live in such a way that people can tell that there's something going on in you that's real. Looking for something real. You can't take your cane and drop it on the ground and it become a a serpent. You can't take something and throw it on the ground and it become a snake and you pick it back up and it turn back into a baseball bat again. You can't do that. But you can be a light to the world. So 
Moses is a reminder that no spiritual giant is without sin. He was a sinner just like me and you. He is a reminder that we can suffer loss because we will at the judgment seat of Christ. But even though you suffer loss for disobedience, failure isn't final with the Father. You still have a job today. God doesn't put the saints on the shelf. He will use you if you are willing. You live for the Lord, be a picture of the prophet of prophets, and he may prolong your prime like he did Moses. But this has just been a quick lesson on one of the most exciting characters in all the Bible.